Hey, welcome. Did you notice? Today's episode is three times as long as our regular episode. So what's up with that? This episode is not your regular debating episode. Or thinking of it, it is your regular debating episode plus a special treat. Sebastian and I are doing this for over two years now. And we were debating, or wondering, maybe the better word, uh, how we can make it more interesting for us and our listeners. And one of the ideas we decided to try is uh, we opened up suggestions. So you can go to todebate.eu slash suggest and suggest a motion. In doing so, you can even sign up to appear on our podcast or debate with us. Giovanni and Agata from UCL London decided to do just that. So today I'm very, very, very happy to bring you the very first debate that was debated based on one of these suggestions. And a full conversation we had with Giovanni and Agata to prepare for the debate where they share insights and some more information about where things are, where things are going, and what they mean when they suggest to open up genetic engineering to the public or not. Also, we had a ton of fun. The audio quality is not the best what we had on this podcast so far, but it's easy to understand. And I do think the content and the fun is what matters. So it's still well worth your time, I think. I listened to it multiple times and I still enjoy it. If after listening to this debate, you think to yourself, I can suggest motions too, or I want to debate something, please don't hesitate to debate.eu slash suggest. And if you want to debate or discuss with us on any of the motions we debated already, or just let us know what arguments convinced you, then please leave us a note. You can write comments in the blog. You can leave a note on Twitter, Facebook, what have you. And we are especially happy when we find a little note and some nice five-star rating or so in iTunes. That also helps others to find our show. And that, by the way, is the number one how you can help us. Keep recommending our podcast. Invite your friends. Send it to your enemies. If you argue with someone on Twitter about a motion that we debated, send him the link to this debate. In the end, we hope to inspire constructive discussion. And you can help by spreading the word. And now, without further ado, on to our latest debate. Now for real. Hello, everyone. Another episode of Two Debates, your podcast of debates, our podcast of debates, our collective debating battle the we, world's podcast the world's of podcast of debate and um, my name is dirk i'm one of your two hosts and i'm looking at sebastian that's still my name i haven't changed it either yeah yeah i i don't plan on changing it anytime soon but we could to confuse our listeners maybe at some point do a name swap no so so you, your name <laughs> could become like a combination could become durian Oh my like god. This, the, the food in <laughs> Southeast Asia. And I could become Sebark. Oh. That something. sounds that sounds lovely. That sounds like Star Trek or Star Wars. Oh yeah. my god, such a good transition to one of our previous debates. Uh, yeah. And again, is Star Wars overrated? Go back to 2D something. <laughs> 2debate.net. Everything we talk about is act listen. And and I'm addressing everyone here. The entire world, listen to us. If you listen to our debates, and there's 53 of them published already, you will have such a comprehensive view and understanding of the world's motions that you will never have to read, listen to the news again, or talk to your friends, or your family, or your colleagues. You'll just know everything. You'll be like in such a, a statement of, in a state of bliss, that yeah. like happiness will flow through your veins, and knowledge will just you know, go, go, go through the pore of your skins, and you're looking at me in a strange way. Am I saying something too much? Is it no. exa exaggerated? I, I'm just suggesting another motion. Is Sebastian humble enough just yet? C come on, I'm French. You know, <laughs> arrogance and French, you, there's nothing to debate about. about. Are the French arrogant? Uh, Sebastian goes first and argues for the motion. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, since you're talking about who's for and against, um, you did raise a good point. You did some statistical analysis on oh, who's yeah. for and who's against because I do flip the coin, but it's a virtual coin that I flip every time. And I use a very famous search engine, which I will not name because apparently the randomness of the flipping the coin 
has not been truly respected. I mean, it is possible that it's truly random, but it's extremely unlikely. Um, we've had 53 debates, 33 of them I was in favor of the motion, 20 against, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. And that is statistically, there was only 5% of the cases where I would have had 33 or more debates uh, for which I would be in favor of. So it's still statistically possible, but quite unlikely. Yeah, it's uh, weird. But it, it also uh, might be something that we do by, I don't know, um, picking the, the flip of the coin moment or what have you. It's weird. We should have a look at that. Maybe uh, I think you you decided quite a life hack, right? Uh, to do quite a life life hack by in in the future flipping a <gasps> real coin. Real coin that still <laughs> exists because you F know cash is still king. F oh my god, this is another great addition <laughs> to, <laughs> to one of our previous debates. What was the name of that debate? I can't remember. It was like is is cash necessary? Should we get no, rid of cash? We should I get rid of cash. Yeah, get rid of cash. Like oh, everything we talk about again, listeners, dear listeners. Listen to our debates. You will not need to. <laughs> I think I've done that already. But keep this for another one. Otherwise, people yeah. get bored of hearing me say the same. Are we thing. living in an endless loop? Uh, Sebastian goes first and argues for the motion. Here, see it again for the motion and first. There is a pattern. Anyway, well, we some are... people say we live in a simulation, right? Uh, some people, including Elon Musk. I think Elon Musk probably comes second after Trump in the in the people that we quote in this podcast. Yeah, uh, Trump is right now the person that we... Uh, we quote the most in this podcast, but Elon Musk is definitely close second. Yeah. Maybe we should start drinking whiskey and smoke pot on the podcast. Is that legal on the internet? Only if you're Elon Musk and only if you're in, in California. Well, if you're in California, it's it's legal, I think, in any case, right? It is legal, I think, in California, but then we're recording this on the internet. <laughs> 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 is there any law on the internet? Nobody knows you're a dog, right? From the famous cartoon from 1993 on the internet. Uh, yeah, I know that cartoon. You, you, uh, another debate we had in the past where you shared that with me. Oh, already. Okay. See, I, rep I repeat myself because I'm either getting too old or. You need to do something in terms of decoration. At least uh, maybe you have a, I don't know, a graffiti behind you on the wall. I know a few graffiti <laughs> artists that can tag your wall if you want to. Uh, yes, I don't think that's a good transition with today's topic, is it? I think we should talk about uh, the the comment, though, that we have in uh, in our blog, right? So you had a bit of a side discussion with one of our oh, listeners. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, someone disagreed I with me, I no, forgot. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I responded. I thought hard about it. Initially, I thought the, the, the argument was good, but then I thought more about it. Come about what, what I responded, but in the end, I'm still right. Ah, all right. So uh, that, <laughs> that is an interesting transition. So, oh, yeah, I see the, I've seen that argument that disagreed with my position. So I thought the argument is good. Then I thought a little bit more, and of course, I'm still right. Oh, he had responded again. I missed that. No, he responded the next day. I missed it. Well, you can respond in the podcast, which is much yeah. cooler, I think. Because yeah. clearly he's uh, listening to us. The debate we are talking about, that was graffiti is vandalism. And uh, you've been in the camp of, of course, graffiti is vandalism, and I'm against that. And Christoph wrote in our blog that he he landed on, on my side, I might add. So he disagreed with your position. The example he gave was the Berlin Wall, right? Yes, that's the example that was provided by Christoph, that... It had become uh, a canvas, a piece of art when it came down. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the argument is uh, is a strong one because imagine the Berlin Wall wouldn't have been painted at all. Like the pure concrete wall that it was in the beginning would have been the the artistic element of that the same? I mean, right now you find pieces of the Berlin Wall pretty much everywhere, right? So, so I thought the argument was a good one, but then I thought more about it in the specifically the specific significance of the Berlin Wall. And you probably know this better than I do, but the Berlin Wall, ever since it was built up, and if I'm not mistaken, 1961 was already charged very strongly with a lot of political historical connotation. It's not just any wall, right? It's more than a wall; it's a border between two countries. So. 
uh, I felt that the analogy was was a good one, but biased because of the of the supercharged connotation of the wall ever since it was built up. A little bit like if you know if if there is that wall across all of the U.S. Uh, to prevent migrants from Mexico to go into the U.S., it would become probably very similar. If there's graffiti on that wall, it would automatically become art because the wall in itself is a part of history. Now, do you really you know think that any wall out there, now your your house's walls, however your house is important to you, Dirk? You know, is maybe not of huge historical significance. And in addition, the Berlin Wall is kind of nobody's property or everybody's property at the same time, right? So it's not, if we make the distinction between individual private property and the common good, the common the common uh, property uh, of, of walls. So again, in this case, we're, we're looking at something which is owned by everyone. So I think it's, it's kind of such a specific case that I felt that in the end, it was just too, more, more of an exception that confirms the rule of everything else. And then there was the comment about New York and the black culture. And I admit, I don't, I don't have enough background on this. The only question I raised was that does black culture's uh, existence only rely or be, or can, can it be reduced to graffiti? I challenged that. I don't know. Right. I, I admit it. Maybe it's possible that tagging your name, your gang's name, your, your neighborhood's name on a wall is a sign of protest and a sign of, of a culture, maybe. I just admit I'm my ignorance on the topic. That is, I think that Christoph's second argument comes down to, right? Where he basically says, it doesn't matter what you think as, uh, if, if you as a teen spray your name on a wall, um, it might not be that you see yourself as being a protester or very artistic in that moment, but uh, in fact, you're you're basically protesting. You're, you're more or less making a statement about you being someone who who may be held back or uh, you just want to do an ugly tag because you can. And that I think uh, we had that in our debate as well. That was one of my arguments uh, that uh, even if you if you're as a tagger, don't think much about it. And you may be just having fun by by violating somebody else's property rights, but it's still a form of protest. And maybe by extension could then be also a form of art if you if you extend that. So this is where I disagree, right? I agree with the form of protest. I agree that this may, may be a youngster, a teenager, a young adult, whatever, who wants to signal that, hey, I exist and I'm not represented in society, but this is a protest. It's not a piece of art. The intention was not art. The intention was to protest. Mm -hmm. This is the distinction that I, I where I, I would still insist on, that the, the initial intent was not creating a piece of art, but actually saying, hey, I exist, don't ignore me, or I'm angry. Or whatever. So, it's the the line is is tenuous, but you know, I'm not. We're not going to do the debate again. But I, I do still consider that there is a there is a strong distinction here. It's very similar to having like let's say a banner during a protest and say, "Hey, I'm for gay marriage," for instance. For me, there's almost no difference. Is your banner a piece of art? No, I don't think so. You're protesting. You're saying what you're uh, you advocating for or what you're against, but you're not creating art, in my opinion. Very well. If our listeners want to look back at the debate, by the way, that would be 2D52, Graffiti is Vandalism. Uh, one of my personal favorites, I have to say, Sebastian claims that I say that every time. That's not true. <laughs> That's absolutely not true. But uh, anyway, it, it is one of my favorites. And I have to say, I'm very happy about seeing comments on, on debates such as this. It gives us an excuse or an opportunity to further engage with the issue and think broader about that and to maybe add to the arguments that we found already. So keep it coming, please. Christoph, thank you very much for for jumping at this. And anyone who listens to our debates, we actually don't even care which debate you do, uh, comment on. So any debate that's in our our backlog of debates is, uh, is game for engagement. I do we think- also had a very nice comment on the App Store in Canada. So thank you to the listeners over there in Canada as well uh, for appreciating the podcast. It is, it's pretty cool that we see the comment. But did you know that iTunes requests uh, requires to have at least three comments before it's shown to anyone five. else? I think it's five now. Five even. Five. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Um, so that means uh, we've seen it. Thank you very much, whoever commented on, uh, on our podcast in Canada. Catherine, if we find yeah. only four other commenters... <laughs> 
<laughs> that will if be so cool. If you come into, we'll give you a badge. <laughs> a t-shirt signed by Dirk. Uh, singing and dancing is always potentially in scope. Let's you see. can do the singing. I can do the dancing. Because yep. if I sing, like, even if people hear what we say or what we sing over the podcast, or if they hear me sing, their windows will break. And I cannot, I will not replace your windows. Yeah, let's just settle on your your singing is a form of protest. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tool here where you can basically record a voice and you can then change the pitch and uh, and really? everything about it. Um, it just sounds a little bit weird, but uh, hey, you just go for the effect, right? That's all intentional. It's part of that uh, pop culture thing that you're about to start. And in, in any case... Um It would not be genetically modified, right? It would be still my natural voice. It's just software modified. Look yeah. at this transition. I'm, I'm, this is just so good. <laughs> R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. Yeah, and here we are uh, coming from uh, our listeners' comment in the blog to another pretty cool uh, change in our format which is a listener suggestion. So uh, what we are going to debate today is a motion that has been suggested by students from UCL, right? That's correct. So University College London, one of the most famous, famous and elite universities in the UK, and they suggested that we debate about genetic engineering and specifically whether it should be accessible to the public, to the general public or not. So this is what we're going to debate on today. So the motion is genetic engineering should be accessible to the public. I will be for the motion that will be against and Dirk, you'll get started. Um, you're first to debate. So whenever you're ready, you have two minutes and the floor is yours. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues against the motion. Genetic engineering and its accessibility to the public. There are two issues in one here, and arguments will be measured probably against both, even though we both know it's just one side that we argue over. So one is a question of genetic engineering in general, how to do it safely, how ethical use would look like. And it's a, it's a high temptation to attack genetic engineering in general and then dismiss the public use as well. And that would be the second aspect, of course, if we talk about genetic engineering, should it be in public hands? So I like to get number one out of the way because I think of myself as somebody supporting genetic engineering. I do think genetic engineering, in fact, is a key to humankind's success. We will eradicate whole classes of diseases with it. We will potentially solve world hunger, at least for the number of people we have on this planet today. Uh, once we solved it for them, probably we double and then we have the same problem again. But uh, let's not go there just yet. In a nutshell, I'm a fan. So I don't think that genetic engineering is evil per se. Besides, Pandora's box is already open. So I'm pretty sure that for everything we can do, someone on this planet will try it if it's interesting enough. So that, that ship has sailed. I'm not arguing over this. What I'm arguing is um, the question about whether or not genetic engineering should be in public hands. And that's a more complicated issue because uh, everything that you can envision as a danger in genetic engineering, and there are plenty of nightmare scenarios you could, you, you could try to come up with, all of this multiplies a thousandfold if you make it cheap enough and easy enough and accessible enough for an uncontrollable mass of people to experiment with. Everything you can think of, uncontrollable diseases, diseases that people inflict on themselves, changes on human genome, uh, bioweapons by bioterrorists, all these things become really, really scary if you put them in an environment where you cannot control its access. Now, an argument could be made that, hey, we cannot avoid it anyway, so let's just spread the knowledge. But I would say we are quite successful in controlling other comparably dangerous technologies in the past. You cannot just walk into a pharmacy and buy any kind of chemical you want to buy, for instance. If, if there's a danger to create an explosive with it, chances are you're going to be reported and somebody will check up with you. Or some, st some stuff even requires you to have a license to have it. There are certain pieces of machinery that you're not allowed to, to buy and purchase without having a proper license. So there are examples where we seem to be able 
at least to, let's say, 80 to 90 percent to control availability to technology. And this is what I'm advocating for in today's debate. I do think it's too dangerous to put genetic engineering in public hands. I'm a fan of genetic engineering, just not for use of everyone. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear his argument. So it's interesting you're a supporter of genetic engineering because I'm actually not so much. And I'll explain why in a second. So it's going to be a, an interesting debate today. So as you said, why genetic engineering? Well, among other things, it's indeed to help cure illnesses. There's a lot of progress in that area. And I'll repeat what you said also in that, in that, in that vein and avoiding maybe having to use chemicals and creating fruits and vegetables that otherwise people would not buy and eat because they're not round enough, they're not red enough, or what have you. And this is actually specifically on that aspect that I'm not too much in favor of genetically modified uh, organisms or food, uh, to talk about that in particular, because I like the raw taste of things. I don't mind if they're a bit damaged, they don't look perfectly round. But I personally, as Sebastian, I don't define what the market wants, what is ready to buy. And even if there is scientific consensus that it's the food that comes from GM crops uh, poses no greater risk than normal conventional food, still, uh, people are concerned about the safety of it. But that's not my point today. My point is, I have my personal perspective on it. And as you said, we're talking about whether we should make it accessible to the public. Um, and here's the thing. It's happening. As you said, the Pandora's box is already open. Do we want this to be reserved to the elite? Do we want this to be reserved only to those who can afford it, who can buy maybe the machines or whatever is necessary to have access to it? My point is that, no, we want this to be democratic and enter access to technology by everyone. But hang on. This comes with a caveat. Access does not mean no regulation, does not mean no control. It means making it, for instance, affordable enough or making it transparent enough so it's not just a lab operating in secret or only rich people who have access to the technology. But that doesn't mean either that you could have access as an individual to a DIY do-it-yourself kit at the supermarket or the pharmacy. So I'm all for access and democratizing access to technology, whatever the technology, but that does not mean it comes with no safeguards and no control or no regulation. So absolutely, genetic engineering, just like any other piece of technology, should be accessible and out there in the open to the general public. And now on to Dirk. Let's hear his rebuttal. There has been a controversy just the past couple of weeks in the States, in the United States, where someone tried to democratize access to handguns. The argument was, yeah, by distributing the blueprints or the, the 3D models that are necessary to 3D print a gun at home, you can demonstrate that information is free and the means to defend yourself should be in everybody's hand anyway. Um, so that was basically at the core of that discussion. And uh, there is a, a fierce battle fought right now over the question if that is really true or not. Because sometimes I would say the risk outweighed the benefit. So you're, you're saying, hey, it should be democratic. Everybody should have access to technology and that can still be regulated, be that as it may. Once you have created an economy of scale, if you will, uh, then market forces kick in and you have thousands and thousands of products coming out based on genetic engineering. And uh, if you believe you can regulate that, then you're in the same boat as people who believed in the 19th they can regulate access to mobile phones and uh, and radio controlled systems, which in fact goes out of the window as soon as enough people are playing with it. So the more people use it, the cheaper it gets, the cheaper it gets, the more people have access, the more people have access, the more it will be done. And then very soon you do it in places of this planet where no regulation is there whatsoever. And that's exactly my point. I do think there's technology out there that's just too dangerous. So we cannot really trust everyday people with a regular high school education to play with it. Uh, there are, there's technology that needs some supervision. And if you have tools and laboratories regulated to the point that only specifically licensed people can access and use it, doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be crazy expensive but uh, it's regulated who can use it and what circumstances and how the access to the, the ingredients that you need and the machinery that you need is regulated. 
if that is the case, then you have at least one place where you can have a close look at and where you can make sure that nothing dangerous is done. Now, second aspect. I do believe uh, you, you kind of trick yourself. You made a statement of democracy, giving it to everyone, making it available for everyone, freedom to the technology and to the people. That's not what's going to happen in reality. In reality, only those people who can afford it will have access to it or at least have first access to it and that means everyone in our society can change their babies at some point to be smarter stronger and better looking than uh, the babies of those who have no access to that technology and i'm really really worried what these kinds of things will do to our society and the gaps this is going to create that's reason number three why i think we shouldn't allow access to genetic engineering technology just to everyone in the public <laughs> Next up, Sebastian. I'm going to respond point by point and maybe raise a few additional points. Uh, your last point was about only those who can afford will be the first to access the technology and then there's the risk of people wanting to change their babies. So here's the thing. Of course, when people um, talk about genetic engineering, the first thing that comes to mind is human DNA manipulation. But genetic engineering is much wider than that. There's a large spectrum of things. So even though you may have in mind this horrible scenario of modifying uh, baby DNA before the baby's born or even after, that's just one case. It's a huge case, but that's just one case. And we can talk separately about this and all the ethical implications. It's slightly out of scope of the debate, but yes, it is just one case. Other than that, it's plants, which genes we can transform. So we don't have to use pesticides, for example. And the rise of commercialized crops has provided economic benefit to farmers in many different countries. And of course, there's controversy around this too. But the point is, there was no reason to restrict the access to this technology just by a few select groups or big companies, right? Individual farmers can now have access to these genetically modified crops. And this has helped them lift them in some cases from poverty. So I want to raise and broaden the spectrum of what we're talking about here to show that it's not just the doomsday scenario that you're painting. And it's also acknowledged that genetic manipulation is intrinsically also a natural process. Nature does constantly transforms genes. The, the difference here is that humans now have the power to do what nature can do naturally and beyond. Of course, sometimes accelerating the process, sometimes trying new things, inventing new organisms. So states could do this. States could do what you are saying is a very bad scenario, a doomsday scenario of uh, eugenism, where you have modifying the DNA of babies to suit whatever perfect type you're expecting from the population. So the, the debate could be then pushed back from the public to the states. And do we want this to be done in secret? Uh, I'd rather have transparency across the board. And this links to the other point we had about saying people would do this in places where there's no regulation. Well, here's the thing. Let's talk about the risks, because as you said, it doesn't have to be crazy expensive to be available. In fact, we're talking about a few thousand dollars. It will become virtually free to manipulate DNA. So the more we talk about it, the more we make it transparent, and we more, the more we educate people about the risks, uh, the less likely you will have problems around this. It's not guaranteed, but because it's out there, as you said, anyway, let's make it as widely uh, open and transparent as possible. And let's make sure that people have access to it. So it's not just a select groups, a few secret groups back like in that corner modifying DNA. I'll finish with the, with the last example. You said, uh, you gave the example of handguns. I want to bring the example of computers. IBM in the 70s thought computers were too big, that no consumer would even want to have them. And then Apple and Microsoft and others came along and thought, well, we're going to make things smaller and make, make it more accessible to consumers. They adapted the technology, which was not considered, at least hopefully not today either, as dangerous to mankind. But Maybe there was indeed a need to democratize the access. Computers should not be restricted to massive mainframes and lab rooms and the public not having access to it. So it's a maybe far-fetched example, but it's just to show that democratization in general benefits uh, everyone and it makes the debate out there in the public uh, open to everyone. So I do think genetic engineering should be accessible by everyone. Final statements. Dirk. Let's hear it. First off, having it in the hands of everyone is not the same as transparency, Sebastian. Just because everyone can do it doesn't mean we have a transparency of what people are doing. Quite the opposite, actually. Secondly, 
I do believe you overestimate the risk awareness of people. Didn't it sound like a brilliant idea to give uh, the combustion engine to the masses? Didn't it sound like an amazing idea to have fertilizers everywhere? Yet now we have global warming and we have hormones in the food chain. And the same is true for genetic engineering. It's, it's pretty early days and already I campaigned doomsday scenarios. We don't know even yet how dangerous this will be once it's unleashed to the public. Which is my core worry. We shouldn't do that. Maybe we should even restrict genetic engineering to certain selected scenarios and not extend further until we actually know what the risks are. Because, uh, yeah, uh, resistant crops may be amazing. Maybe it kills our biodiversity. And we don't know until we really explore the technology. So no. Uh, it shouldn't be in the hands of the public. It should be tight controlled. Genetic engineering is great as long as we are careful and learn from past mistakes. Thank you very much. Sebastian. So you put the debate between the having putting this in the hands of everyone versus transparency. I'm not saying that we should put this in the hands of everyone with no restriction or regulation. Let me take another example very quickly. Cannabis. Cannabis has been legalized in Canada and a few other countries. It still comes with regulation, right? So it may actually have prove useful or not uh, for the health of, of humans, but it has been you know, legalized. But it, it's not that it's in the hands of everyone, of every child or every person who wants to produce so much uh, cannabis that they're overwhelming the market, right? It is restricted. There's certain doses that can be used per person per day or whatever, I don't know the details, but this is generally the case in the Netherlands, in Uruguay, and Canada. Fertilizers can be an engine. Are you saying they, these are not good ideas? Yeah, they're polluting the planet, but it also allowed fantastic growth of the economy and to feed the planet. It, it allowed to feed the planet. Now realizing the, the consequences doesn't mean we should try. We should not try to fix it, but I still believe the combustion engine and fertilizers were beneficial to the, to the entire population. It's just we can't go that way for the next centuries. That I agree with. But it was certainly very beneficial for the entire humanity from the early 20th century to the second part of the 20th century to allow to feed the planet and for people to transport themselves and not reserve this to the few, to the little elite who had the means or who had the access to knowledge to be able to use all this. So I think all these examples, cannabis, fertilizers, combustion engine, computers, everything we brought up actually go into the same vein that they should be accessible to the public with uh, restriction or regulation if necessary. Um, it's funny because I, I, so what's your, you, you started off by saying that you have, uh, you're generally in favor of genetic engineering. I'm actually, I, I'm specifically for the food area, by the way, this is what I started off by saying, personally, I don't, I don't want food to be modified. I'm happy if it looks ugly or whatever. Like I, uh, the question is for what you modified. I mean, the fact of the matter is we are doing genetic engineering for, for the millennia now. It's just at a much smaller scale. And I do believe that genetic engineering of modern uh, with modern methods will be much more controlled and probably more powerful and more precise than past techniques that we use. So um, if done right, you can have all the benefits without the downsides. And uh, when it comes to modifying just one property of a plant or anything like this, I do believe this is very powerful. Do you uh, think we can avoid the downsides though? I, I do feel that we, it's it's back to your point about, we don't know the consequences, honestly. Like we may modify one one variable, but then not be not actually realize we modified like it, tons of secondary variables without without realizing it. Like which, which, which that first variable influences other variables. That's what I, that's what I mean. Gosh, I would love we, as a species, we would learn from past mistakes, as I said. So what do I believe? I believe what will be possible is um, to create precisely what you want to create in a lab where it becomes probably hard to to know and understand is what happens when you put that out in the wild and let nature and the world do their thing. I don't want to spoil the discussion that I will add to this episode where we talked with our UCL students and they have very interesting perspectives on that. But uh, in general, I do believe uh, in a lab, w controlled by experts, it's less likely to go wrong than if it's controlled by everyone. In the past, whenever we just made things uh, available for everyone, 
it seemed to be that the consequences were only bad when everybody started doing it. I would love that at some point we learn the danger of not always releasing everything to the public before we completely understand it. I think the danger that you're highlighting here, just thinking about it, maybe I, I could have thought about it before, but I think the danger here that you're highlighting for the general access by the public is the is, is the law of big numbers, yeah. right? It, because people, I think, individually are too lazy <clears throat> to actually use let's say to modify computers, to modify DNA, like there's going to be a very, very few geeks in their garages modifying DNA. Honestly, people are just too lazy. They just want to enjoy life. I'm, like, I'm simplifying, but yeah, I think that the problem with the access by population is that because we're talking about 7 billion people. So the minute you release cars out there, everyone wants to have a car. Right? Like you know, China's waking up, like the China's, China's middle class is becoming so massive. Everyone wants, wants to have a car. Right, so everyone wants to go on, on vacation, so they're taking flights. Um, I think that that's the problem, which is which is just a numbers problem. It's not an individual decision problem as much. Yeah, and which which can be so. So this is maybe where we the way we channel technology into the hands, as you're saying, of the public. Maybe is is by thinking about the consequences of multiplying technology by seven billion people. Yeah, and the other thing is also, um, again. Um, our experts uh, shared knowledge there that there are ways to to let's say uh, put safety guards on on uh, genetic engineering uh, in terms of making sure that it cannot multiply without uh, being uh, really tightly controlled all these things and I have doubts if these safety measures uh, are fully understood before we start releasing the whole thing to the public I would have I would love to be in a world where we have those safety measures at least at the same time that we release things and the knowledge about how to do this right uh, released at the same time instead of ju uh, just making it available before we understand how to make it safely. And this is, this is this, uh, I think, the danger in here. The, the, the materials that are required and the technical ability is becoming so cheap these days that, as you said, literally, at least in the Western world or in the industrialized world, everyone can have access to that. And um, my worry is that we, we are running for the possibility first and uh, developing the safeguards later, as always. That is what always happened. First, we have the disaster and then we learn from the disaster how to make it safely. The only danger is that at some point it might go too quickly for us to catch up. Are you optimistic or pessimistic overall in general? I do think uh, what will what might happen, and actually that's a bit of a, a positive scenario. Somebody will make a mistake that is scary enough, but also contained enough, so we will wake up and and uh, regulate around it. Uh, that's what most of the time happens if you think of it. It's true. It's true. Be because this is a this planet is a big place, and humankind is actually we have law of uh, large numbers also works in our favor in that case let's say somebody by accident creates a super virus chances are that still in air quotes just a few thousands die of that and after that we learned our lessons so uh, or even a few million I mean, even if even if it's a few million yeah i mean it's sad but it's yeah sorry is that pessimistic optimistic somewhere in the middle what would you say <laughs> I think it's reasonably op optimistic that bad things will happen, but in the end, things will be all right. Yeah, that's what I think. And I do think for humankind, genetic engineering will be um, probably worth the risk. I do hope that we do it in a smart way, though. Fair enough. Let us know what you think in the comments. Email us, go to the website and uh, stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you and thank you, Sebastian, for debating with me. Ah, oh. hi. Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah, no, no, we can hear. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe that Sebastian plans to join as well. So uh, in a few minutes, you you get the full the full two debate crew in front of you. How's Ger you guys are from Germany? Um, I'm from Germany, I mean, um, but Sebastian is actually he lives in Switzerland, but he's from France. Ah, okay. and uh, he has a pretty complicated uh, second name because he's actually I do believe his mother is French and his father is Polish or something like that. Cool. So he managed to get a name for himself that neither the French nor the Polish can actually pronounce. <laughs> no way and i feel like my language is impossible because i'm polish 
Hmm. Wait a moment. I paste it. Shinsky ah. Clement. Shinsky. Yeah, that's how I got to Google. Clement. Clement, I suppose, is the French suffix. I guess so. And it's <laughs> in in France. It would be, uh, you know, the French version of Sebastian would actually be Sebastian. But it would be yeah, written yeah, differently. Yeah. So he managed to yeah. get himself a German spelling for the first name too. And uh, so the, the Americans uh, call him Sebastian like I do, which is actually yeah. not right. Uh, the French call him Sebastian, which is not right either. And <laughs> so he's, Isn't he called then Sebastian? Sebastian? That would be like Polish I do pronunciation. Yeah, I do believe he's, he's... Well, I never called him anything else than Sebastian and he seemed to be fine with it, but we have to ask him. <laughs> Maybe that's a mystery to solve. Sebastian, we were we were trying to uh, well guess how the proper pronunciation of your name is because it turns out we have Sebastian. It's easy. Is it really Sebastian? <laughs> but because it's written like Sebastian. Well, it depends. Yeah, if you speak like a German, where, where are you from? Are you are you British? Both of you? British, Polish, po Polish. Oh, okay. So that's probably why you probably guess where my last name is from. Yeah, we like it's French and Polish like kind of joined together. Yeah, that's correct. My father's Polish, just from uh, a city next to uh, Łódź, Zdunskawola. Do you know? I heard about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. What, what, are we, what are we talking about today, Dirk? You're the you're the master of ceremony uh, as always. The master of ceremony. Yeah, I ho always have the pleasure of uh, <laughs> covering for you being not prepared, right? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got a motion suggestion or a suggestion for a motion, uh, which was genetic engineering should be accessible to the public. And that's right. So, yeah. so, so what, what prompted you to suggest this? Why is it close to your heart? So we're both biology students at UCL, and there's this competition called iGEM. I'm not sure if you've heard of it before. International Genetically Engineered Machine. And the idea is universities get together, or they compete with each other more than anything, and they produce organisms which have been engineered for different purposes. So people, you know, make better beer or biofuels. We're making spider silk with our organisms. And this whole competition is aimed to make genetic engineering easier. It's yeah. meant to, like, stick DNA together like Lego. And if that's the case, then one day, you know, the public... This is going to be able to access it because a lot, all of the synthetic genes that we make, all the procedures that are made available online for the judges, but anyone can access them from our wiki web pages. And in that case, they can either do something similar or modify our synthetic genes or uh, just get inspired in general and they can form their own synthetic genes for other purposes or same purposes. So in a way, it's, through this process, it's going to become more standardized and simpler and more accessible. And one day, who knows, it might reach a level where just general public will be able to create their own GMOs. It's, it's a giant open source project for DNA genetic engineering, essentially. And it all started in MIT, uh, 20, 2005, maybe? Yeah, yeah, early, early 2000. And what they did was said, Let's make a big competition out of it and get students to do all the labor. So now we work in the lab, we create the pieces and we send it to them. And they put it on this big website where people can say, I want you know, this DNA, this DNA and this DNA. They get it sent and they piece it all together and they make whatever they want to make. How much does it cost today to, let's say, to, let's say produce something genetically modified or engineered? How much would you say it costs to, to do something simple? Less than a thousand pounds. I would say like 100 to 100 because you have to synthesize your, you have a sequence of your gene which you modify. Usually the genes are available for free from the, the registries for like human genes, mouse genes, E. coli genes, and other bacteria and so on. And so these, you can modify them for free. Then you have to send them the sequence to a company which usually synth synthesizes the DNA as a chemical because DNA itself is a chemical. And that usually costs around like, let's just say, 100 pounds per sequence. And then you have to grow your bacteria, which a batch would probably be around, let's just say, 50 pounds. It's, not, yeah. it's not that much. You have to have some petri dishes and some media. The so problem I would say, at the moment is yeah. the machinery, I'd say. Yeah, the machinery. Um, 
um, because you have to have certain incubators to keep your bacteria growing, let's just say, and then you have to have measurements. So if you make fluorescent proteins, for example, you have to have a reader, which may cost over like 5,000. Well, no, the, the machines and then cost the PCR. hundreds of thousands, but yeah. usually, you know, you, you outsource this stuff and send it over. Yeah, you can blend the machine labs. so you don't have to purchase it. So you can or... grow the bacteria. I think, I think Dirk, Dirk, you've got kids, right? You could grow the bacteria on them, right? You can take bacteria from your own skin. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, that, I, I guess uh, from what, what I hear is uh, it sounds very much like, uh, uh, I'm not sure if, if all this stuff is available on the free market um, as it is right now, but it sounds very much like the kind of price tag that you would have put on 3D printing a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Five, yeah. To, five to 10,000 bucks and you have a little uh, laboratory going and then you can start doing things. Uh, you're saying like, you know, the, the laboratories, the great thing is that there's these thing called open bio hack spaces, which are public places and people just pay a small fee to go into them and use the machines which are there and this can sometimes you know, cost in the 10 20 30 pounds a month or 30 euros in your case i suppose and these are becoming a lot more you see that they're rising they're on the rise and at the moment they've opened up a new one in london so we have two they've opened up one in the north of england we've got three in america it's even it's even bigger so yeah. you know diy biohacking as they call it in in these public spaces well, one of the previous UCL projects on Ajam was actually to make a machine which is uh, used to make you know, increase the number of copies of DNA called PCR machine, and they were trying to do a DIY, so decrease the cost to less than a thousand pounds. And they just use simple like boxes and put some like uh, vessels for like chemical reactions to take place. So it, 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 it's feasible to even make it cheaper. So it was like a tiny lab in a box that you could use. So I suppose the elephant in the room here is uh, uh, human, right? Human gene human engineering yeah. hacking, right? And the, and the con controversy or the ethical implications of that. How do you react to that? What's your take on it? Or, or do you have discussions between yeah. class with the, with the professors, with the researchers? What, what do you yeah, think? Because I, mean, I, I guess this is the big elephant in the room, right? Like nobody would, well, nobody, I guess few of us would have issues like, Genetically, you know, modifying or engineering like plant DNA, right, or spider DNA, we have some issues, but maybe not as big as modifying mm -hmm. the DNA of humans. Yeah. Well, that, that is true. We are discussing it and um, in lectures, and we're mentioning it. And in different countries, there are different regulations. So, for example, in China, they already modified a couple of human embryos to, for example, remove a gene for certain um, inborn defects. But it hasn't worked at the moment. But they're trying. Um, in USA and UK, it's more restrictive, but recently there, um, there's a PhD um, student who's doing a project on looking at uh, important genes in development. So she's trying to actually delete them and see what sort of defects are made in human embryos up to seven days because you're not allowed to modify an um, embryo that is older than that because it starts to develop certain organs such as nerve tissue. Um, so uh, from certain point, I think people, most scientists consider uh, uh, an embryo human as a person um, as soon as the central nervous system starts to develop. And that's seven probably days? Around, yeah, that's would... around after seven days, like probably up to a week or yeah. two. You, you start to so, the first uh, cells of nerves for nerves. A question on that, uh, if, I, if I may jump in here. Um, is it always a given um, that that you have to modify the genes of an embryo or anything in order to experiment on humans? Or can you basically inject modified material into a normal yeah. body as well, right? In adults, yes, but it's less effective because in, in adults, you um, the problem is, in, you know, in embryo, you've got stem cells that will divide and they will go through different pathways to create different tissues. Whereas in adults, you already have them formed uh, for a long, uh, after a long period of time. So you're, you have fewer stem cells. Um, so for example, if I were to cut off my hand, I wouldn't be able to grow an adult hand because it was growing with me for many years and adjusting to the proportion of my body. Whereas in embryo, if you were to cut a small part, it would quick, very quickly regenerate because it's uh, still at a very early stage. But um, so in adults, there have been attempts to modify certain uh, cells, for example, cancer cells. They, they're they trying to actually kill them through, um, let's just say, activating tumor suppressors. Again, because the cancer cells, they often switch them off to uh, 
propagate and generate tumors. Um, so you, it will work in one tissue or maybe few tissues, whereas in embryos, you can easily affect all tissues all around. So it's better to usually modify and genetically engineer at early stage. So I worked with um, sea urchin embryos and I modified them very early at um, the time of fertilization, straight away, you would insert a gene or delete a gene. It's also an interesting point. I'm not sure if it's what you meant, but also inserting, of course, DNA into an adult body or into any cell is possible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're talking about editing embryos at an early stage, but gene therapy is all about editing human cells at a later stage. Yeah. So what they're doing there is still editing the human body. Just what if, you know, one day we can edit that human body to what, you know, we not have blonde hair or have bigger forearms if people wanted that, whatever it is. Why does it matter if it's happening at the embryo stage or at the adult stage? Mm -hmm. It's still, you know, if the technology is there, is, is, is the question, you know, are we playing God? by? Yeah, the, uh, uh, it depends on the efficiency, though, because I feel like in adults, the efficiency to uptake synthetic gene is much yeah. lower because the body is much more like bigger. And, and I have a very annoying colleague. Let's see if we can, <laughs> let's see if we can modify anything in their gene and if it actually works. I'm willing to pay. Yeah, that's why we do that through a distant uh, connection, usually our debating. Well, I, I do so think... One, is this why I'm in a jail right now and I can... Yeah. <laughs> why does it look like a shower here, That, uh, that the room that Sebastian invited me to? Um, I, I do think one, one important difference is uh, it makes a... a if you... If you compare the the two approaches, like um, editing the genes of an embryo versus injecting something in a in an adult body, uh, you could you could make an argument that in one case it's basically an adult making the call to to do something to themselves, in the other we we are as you said playing God a little, and also the you you mentioned a, a, a whole range of regulations right and those regulations need to be enforced in order to really work and you cannot enforce them outside the scientific community so when you say genetic engineering accessible to the public that also implies that i can go to one of these maker spaces and do something and nobody can stop me from that um and it's i do think it's not only humans right it's also me just producing my own crop and bringing it out and nobody really being on charge for the security of that or and really having done the due diligence to make sure that uh, it really does what i believe it does so, so so something about the the crops is of course people grow genetically engineered crops in the wild and it's great because you know they grow bigger they they can fight off pests, whatever. But the big, the big concern people have about this technology in the wild is what if that DNA in the plant gets out and goes into a, into a bacteria, for example? You know, the plant is resistant to certain chemicals. If that bacteria takes up that gene, they're going to become resistant. They're going to become stronger. We won't have that power to fight it off. Yes. So it's important to have yes. something which is referred to as biocontainment, <laughs> which is containing that DNA within a closed system. And there's so much technology which people are developing to be able to do this, which is super interesting. I wouldn't say all of it, but one of our supervisors on our project is looking to change DNA completely into a different structure so that if this organism is to take up the XNA, as it's referred to from the plant, it won't, it won't function. Yeah, it won't be able to use it because it's kind of DNA, if you think about it, it's a code. So we have the ATGC bases and they make up uh, any any sort of like combination of them will make up a gene and, and uh, define the different amino acids within a protein. And uh, XNA has like slightly different bases. I think it has uh, Z and P at the moment and the chlorouracil as well. Which is, and these bases are chemically different than the bases found in nature therefore they require different enzymes and if an organism from the wild takes them up it cannot read them cannot read the code so as if i send you let's just say you're a python programmer and i will send you a javascript code and you probably wouldn't be able to understand all of it or, uh, or th there may be some similarities but you may not be able to apply them all of them 
and it's a whole different language. So, so it's, it's like a bio, yeah. So that acts as a biocontainment. Another method that people use is just isolate them, the genetically modified organisms physically. So they may grow seed crops within just greenhouses, and they prevent any sort of pollination or any seeds getting into the wild. Or if they modify, like just say a salmon, they just keep the salmon in the containers, and they prevent them from being able to reproduce. So they may might make the first generation infertile, so they cannot grow because. A lot of the organisms that are modified, they have modifications to make them grow faster. So they could potentially outcompete the species found in the wild, which would be very bad for the ecosystems if they do die out and go extinct. You, you seem very excited and uh, interested in the topic you're talking about, and I'm not surprised. Does it worry you? Are you scared of anything? Like, you know, things being, being grown out in the wild and like out of control? And by the way, like we both, like Doug and I are both engineers and you know, we love science. Uh, so I, I think we understand pretty well what you're talking about. And in and, and our debate, we try to systematically have one side versus another, right? So we randomly assign a side versus another. So inevitably, we would talk about this aspect of, and, and when it's me who has to be against, let's say, progress uh, or scientific progress, I would, I would usually try to paint a very bleak picture. Um, and and the other the other aspect that would that would come about very often in our debates is that well even if we legalize or or we make things illegal or we try to contain it the thing is it's probably going to be some mad scientist in North Korea or China or Russia or somewhere in someone's you know backyard doing something anyway are you not scared or worried or, or about or what what challenges do you see it's, it's quite interesting yeah obviously mm. the people could design. A biological weapon, Bio which is weapons, something yeah. that scares me because there are certain strains that can kill more easily than others. They're called more virulent. So if people create a super, let's just say, super influenza that would flu that would, you know, spread through just people coughing at each other, that would like really terrify me. I, and I there would, were some please don't, please don't send me an email with the virus, please. I've already infected my computer. <laughs> so that actually, it'll be a post, it'll be a letter. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. So, uh, yeah, and of course, this is DNA we're talking about, but obviously th there's a recent, uh, I don't know if it's an outbreak in America with guns and people posting the blueprints for making guns open to the public. I is this something, you know, people are scared of or not so much if people can manufacture their own weapons? Is it so much different to producing a biological weapon? I mean... Yes, because you can't see it physically, mm. but the way that uh, things are controlled in the DNA world, when you order a sequence from a company which will produce your DNA, they have a big screening method. So, you know, they, they have a big bank of their own DNA. And if they, if they notice that this thing you're ordering happens to come from HIV or other pathogens, a dangerous mm. bacteria, it'll flash a red light and they'll recognize it and they'll be able to say, no, we're not going to make this because it's yeah, going to kill the world. Yeah, whatever. but the problem is if they can find a way to synthesize the genes themselves, that's a, like one problem that could be. Another problem for me is like, with the human genetic modifications. What if people, you know, it would be create an inequality that, you know, let's just say only rich people would make can make their children modify them so they would be smarter and more good looking. Mm -hmm. So therefore they would have like better chance of life whereas the poor people would just be stuck with, you know, just having normal children or children with defects and they wouldn't be able to help these children, cure these children or whatever. And there would be a big inequality within society with the rich people using this new technology and then poor people being deprived of it. And, um, I don't yeah, know, yeah. would create, I don't know, maybe instances of racism or even bigger separation and segregations and uh, just in general, that kind of is quite a bit scary. And I think so what would you do? What would you do if you were to regulate or to control things or try to control things? Because as you said, oh. even even beyond, even even before going talking about you know, mass contamination, it's even like, like categorizing people and, and being able to distinguish people by certain strands of DNA, right? Leads to segregation. Like even even mm -hmm. even before talking about like infection and, and risk of disease spreading, you you already have the risk and you and you see this in Europe, right? This this fear of immigration and xenophobia. Just by the way people just look, right? The skin yeah. color or where you're from, right? So imagine you can do this with almost a mathematical formula. Right? It's data, after all. It's what you said, right? It's the different bases which form the DNA. So you could say, hey, after all, I'd, 
I just want to have anyone who has, you know, 27% of T's and 25% of A's in their, in their DNA base. So, so what would you do? What would you do to, or would you do anything? Or, or, or is it what you're saying also, or I'm hearing between the lines, uh, that you, you want to democratize, you know, a genetic engineering so that everyone can have access to it because there's just no way we can regulate anything. What should we, and it, it should, and you should not allow just the rich people to be able to have access to it. How do you resolve the dilemma? What do you do? What would you want to do? <laughs> That's a big question that gen- like scientists in general are asking themselves right now. But I would say when, when it comes to preventing in, like social inequality is to make, for example, therapies, gene therapies accessible to everyone, to everyone who has a like, health care and has access to it. So to make them um, accessible just as with antibiotics and any other medication, just give equal access to everyone regardless of their ethnicity or their uh, income. Uh, also as well, prevent um, any sort of modifications which will give people advantage over others. So I would say uh, cosmetic modifications to change people's hair color, I don't think they should be enabled that much because then they would make, for example, people more uh, favor only a certain type of appearance over others, which I think will make it unfair for others who want to stay natural and so on. And, and, and they don't give any sort of benefit in, in the except social benefits, let's just say. They don't give any biological benefits that, that much. And um, uh, yeah, so prevent these sort of senseless modifications which make it unfair or like, uh, besides certain uh, like in modifying people's intelligence, I think we still don't know what intelligence is 100% and how it's defined within biology. We still don't understand every aspect. We're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Yeah. Right? It's a matter of decades at most. Right, we're gonna we're gonna build we're gonna be able be able to map yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, but certain it? traits, like for example, even somebody's body weight, they're very complex. They're affected by hundreds of genes, and we still don't know all the interactions between genes and how they're regulated. And um, yeah, I think so. Certain things they shouldn't just be tweaked around with because we might do more damage than in any sort of good. I think it's also as well. It's unfair. It would be unfair to the child to. You, you know, um, to, for parents to decide everything because there were already issues with when there was one child policy when they aborted lots of female fetuses just in favor to have sons because they were perceived better than uh, by the society. So it would be unfair to create, you know, a sort of modifications for intelligence and abort all the all the fetuses. You would expect to have like certain genes to make them stupid, but you know, just because you carry a gene, it doesn't mean that you have the trait hundred percent because the environment and the re- regulatory processes affect so the final results that we I, get. I guess it comes down to a couple of things here. One is the question is how dangerous is it really? And it feels like we don't know uh, to the example with a self printed gun. Well, the self printed gun at least is not self replicating if you do it ro- uh, wrong. Right. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, um, if we if we have a, a virus spreading that somebody designed or I don't know uh, something out in the wild that is uh, dangerous, um, having democratized genetic engineering would also mean that people can try to fight this in a decentralized way, <laughs> very much like the internet. The internet is not only empowering those who have the servers in the middle; they are also empowering everybody to become citizen journalists or um, free speak act, uh, speech activists or what have you. And that same debaters. Hmm? Debaters. Debaters, for instance, <laughs> yes. <Like me. laughs> um, so, uh, so after after Sebastian would have drawn his very bleak picture, that would be my counter argument on this. Like, uh, if we if we assume for a second we cannot stop it anyway. Uh, by the way, how do you rank with your friends who are not in that field or your family members? What do they? <laughs> Trying to explain oh yeah, them. trying to explain to them, but let's just say they do have strong, uh, usually opinions against it. They're like, I don't want to touch any GMO food. Like, I disagree. And then you tell them, oh, you know, for example, you have a pet that has been artificially bred for like thousands of years. So that is a genetic modification in its own because you select for certain genes and you make them more common in the next generations. And they say like, no, no, but it's like all natural and it's been for a long time. And I just like. Well, genetic engineering could be smart in them breeding because you could avoid a lot of unwanted, deformed animals, let's just say, or plants, and by being clever about it and just modifying a small region rather than modifying the entire organism, which usually happens in breeding. So if you breed, let's just say, for a friendly dog, 
then what often happens is it starts to have like floppy ears and white uh, fur with patches and, and things. So you have all the all these side of effects you don't really want. Whereas in genetic engineering, you just select one tiny portion of DNA and you just modify that region and that's it. So you usually see only the effect you want. It's very rare to have so many side effects. I guess. Yeah. Also, also people my- seem to not know how much uh, of of their surroundings actually is artificial, right? But uh, I mean, yeah, like exactly. like uh, like broccoli, for instance, hasn't been around 60 years ago, and uh, and people just no, think no. it's it didn't exist in the wild. <laughs> like our carrots, most of the food we eat, it doesn't exist in the wild. So they're meant to be purple. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're meant to be purple and small. Bananas meant to have seeds and. And, what do you say, Giovanni? Your elephants are supposed to be purple. Are you sure you're not like elephants? Are purple? <laughs> <laughs> you're not. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're a student, right? That's what you said, right? No. I get, no. I get it. I get it. I get it. It's, <laughs> it's genetically modified plants that you're smoking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're just gonna do like the Elon Musk podcast. Yeah, you've seen this last week, maybe Elon Musk. I'm a fan of Elon Musk, but I haven't seen the podcast. Yeah, he was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and it, it made the headlines because he was. The, the podcaster uh, like uh, offered him to smoke a, a, a joint. And it was in California, so it's legal, right? So there was a recording, a webcam recording of it. So you see him taking puff, just one puff, right? He says, you know, it's I'm not into it anyway. So he made the headline just a bit stupid because it, it, it was out of proportion. Anyway, <laughs> I've seen the memes. I'm just messing there. with you. Like this is the podcast episode where we're offering joint to students. You but know? you used it. You used that because uh, what Elon Musk also said uh, in. Relevant to one of our past debates, he basically agreed with my side on the question whether or not flying cars are stupid. And you said, do you really trust somebody who's smoking weed on the podcast? That's what you answered. (laughs) 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 Just one part. We debated on whether uh, the future will be underground tunnels in one of our debates or flying cars. You know, as you may know, Elon Musk, one of his companies is digging tunnels for for, for, like a tunnel system. Um, yes. So we, we we brought that that topic up. Um, are you are you not afraid to come back on the on the perception of public perception of you know of our of our respective fields? I'll give you an example, like the trend, the recent trends, ten years ago with the financial meltdown. You know, bankers were like considered like the enemy of the people. <laughs> it's kind of kind of the tech industry, like Silicon Valley, like companies like ours, like Google, like Facebook, like you know, oh privacy or user trust or whatever. Are you not aware that maybe in ten years' time it's going to be biologists and you know, bioengineers who are going to be like, uh, like under the yeah. under the eye of public criticism and saying, "What are you guys doing with with our DNA?" Are you? It's interesting. I think because science or biology mm. as a whole has always been under and the, the radar, especially <laughs> with stem cell technology and, and evolution. Even Darwin was thinking evolution's always you know it's questioned, and even now there's new theories coming out. And oh, where was I going with this? So, oh yeah, and CRISPR technology came out very recently, which Mm. It sparked a giant fire about whether this GMO technology is fair or not. But the thing is, I don't know, with uh, with GMOs, somebody always has to win if there's going to be a profit with it. In a few years ago, there was Monsanto, which had engineered some crops so, which were so resistant it's... to chemicals or bacteria even, which allowed, them, which allowed the farmers to you know, grow them much better. And grow them on high concentration of pesticides. The only people who benefited from that was Monsanto selling yeah. this crop, this this uh, chemical, I suppose. And whereas the poor farmers got poorer because they couldn't afford to buy yeah. this. Yeah, because they made them actually destroy the seeds each time they would regrow because they said, oh, these seeds are copyrighted, so we won't let them grow. Mm. But I feel like so biologists are always roasted constantly for like different things, for like new medical therapies or just uh, right now for genetics, like should we like play around with this or not? Like it's not natural and, and, and things like that. That is because a lot of people, they don't really understand the, uh, the process underneath and how simple it is and the fact that, you know, we live in an artificial world and they, they kind of don't accept it because they see a computer every day. So I think like, oh, it's a daily, everyday object. But a hundred years ago, it wasn't. It mm-hmm. was something completely different and not everyone had access to it. Society sort of, you know, builds around science as much as science also builds around society. Like, you know, we want to be accepted and they want us to accept them. So it's a bit of a dual relationship. So, um, sorry, good. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Policies and 
all these laws, you know, always put in place, place from the moment the technology comes out. Well, sometimes they have to catch up. But I feel like with data engineering, some of them could be a bit more lenient and some of them could be stricter in other places. Yeah. Like, I think it needs to be adjusted. And what they usually do, obviously, is they just say no to everything. And then yeah. slowly they'll be like, okay, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of... Once evidence comes out that everything is safe and whatever. I guess depending on the country, you have indeed this, this mechanism, this pendulum. I guess in countries like Germany... You have a tendency to regulate before. No, no, it's true. Like, like if you yeah. like in the tech industry, you have a tendency to regulate before things happen. In the US, it tends to be more permissive, right? Like, let's see what happens, and then we then you intervene to regulate the market. What do you want to do when you grow up? Apart from <laughs> apart, 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 apart apart from copying me, because you know you want to replicate the same like the perfect DNA. Apart, apart from that. Apart from that. <laughs> That's a hard question, actually. I've just graduated. So yeah. I have bombardment from my family. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Me. No, no, I'm, I'm doing my final master year, so my dad is just like waiting for me to come off this payroll. <laughs> I haven't decided, so it's a bit open. It could be like create our own. Ideally, I would have my own company, maybe some sort of business idea to relate it to my degree, but it I could also do a PhD or just work in industry for a science company that make it equipment, like for example, thermo scientific or something. I haven't decided. Like just, or I could be, you know, in, as a geneticist, I can help people because my degree is human genetics. So we talk a lot about inborn diseases and things. So I could essentially become a clinical geneticist if I want to. On my side, I considered a career in what is referred to as science communication and public engagement. Because I found it super interesting during this project, iGEM, this summer, a big element of it is reaching out to the public and, you know, telling them what you're getting up to, what's, what's going on and writing articles, they're doing podcasts, whatever it is. Yeah, science journalism. And it's something which I've grown very fond of and I'm considering a career in, depending on, I, <laughs> too soon to say, for sure. Dirk, you're hiring anyway for the podcast, right? We can have this science columnist. Oh yeah, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if we can afford him yet, but uh, the, we we let them uh, continue to develop the the genetic engineering future, and uh, once they are done with their current degree, then we reconsider. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations of books or YouTube channels? I think that if like if people who listen to us may be oh, interested yeah. to discover more, like are there things that you found particularly enlightening or a good explanation of what this is all about? Definitely. I know this book about that talks about future and the past of DNA. I think it's called by Richard Dawkins. <laughs> the the uh, selfish uh, gene about my one while you look that up. <laughs> yeah, I need to. <laughs> There's a scientist called George Church, who's the founding father of synthetic biology. And he's massive in, he's still alive and he's massive in the, in the US, around the world, supposedly. Oh, no. And he's written a book called Regenesis, which is all about the future of synthetic biology and also the past and sort of showing how different technologies have enabled Symbio to go forth. One thing he proposed, which I found super interesting, was chimeric life. I, I, do you know chimeric molecules? No. You know how things can't overlap, they, you know, you get left-handed and you get right-handed atoms and chemicals molecules even so life exists in the left-handed form and you know dna proteins everything exists like this but that's because life evolved that way you can also find right-handed molecules in the world which wouldn't interact with the left hand he has this big futuristic vision which i found super interesting which is basically designing life in the right hand and that means viruses can't attack right-handed humans because viruses are left-handed Bacteria can't attack humans because they're right-handed. And then it opens up this big, you know, ethical debate again about, you know, can right-handed and left-handed humans have babies? You know, humans would need right-handed food. They'd have to, it, 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 it's just a very bizarre concept I really enjoyed. Yeah, I have for like two authors to recommend. Well, sorry, the first one I got him wrong. His name is Adam Rutherford, and he talks about the origin of life, so how the very first cell came about and how we evolved, and also the future of life, where they talk about biocontainment uh, techniques such as synthetic bases and where the genetic engineering is heading. So it's like a double book, and on each side is the future and then the origin. And I think it's uh, excellent because it's well explained on level that's probably not too advanced. 
so it's not too heavy for people who don't really do science that much. And also, I really like Richard Dawkins and and one of his books, The Blind Watchmaker or The Greatest Show on Earth, is about evolution and a lot about DNA. But he also made some books specifically about genes called the selfish genes. So how genes actually want to survive and and then they just keep on replicating in us through generations. So they sort of um, they, they try to survive as much as they can. So we, the whole idea is that living organisms are just vessels for these genes to propagate for there. And yeah. Something very frustrating I find with you know videos and books about synthetic biology at the moment is that because the technology is fairly new, there's constantly something new being added. So mm-hmm. a book which is five years old now is still relevant, but technology speaking, it's something which isn't applicable anymore perhaps because you know it's been superseded by many other books or movies or whatever else it is yeah we know the feeling like computer science yeah <laughs> like it's like computer science it, it you know it progresses so fast like each new laptop is like much much better than the previous one and every year there's new advancements new better cpu chips and better screens and so on so synthetic biology is quite progressing especially crispr is progressing very fast mm. But uh, what I don't like about, for example, you know, in media sometimes is that um, two things I don't like about it. One is that the general public says uh, all these science advancements are very scary and they're bad for you and they do these bad things because they don't understand how science is done or the scientists making the science very complex. They can present it in a very complex way using complex words that only themselves they understand. So a uh, biologist would write an article and then a physicist would even, even a scientist from another field wouldn't understand it. And in, in a way, it makes it prevents it from being accessible to the public and makes the science very isolated in sort of progress, I think. So we need to work on the way we present science. Yeah. Any good movies you can recommend, despite the fact that it's outdated after five years? But I guess when you go to the cinema and watch a movie, maybe it's not, that doesn't have to be that bleeding edge for the story to work. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Movies about synthetic biology? Um, Related. Maybe Prometheus. Yeah, like Alien or Prometheus, kind of. <laughs> it's a very scary very movie. <laughs> but the, 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 you know, the aliens, they act as like some, sort, like some sort of engineers. So it's quite interesting. That was in unexpected. Way, but it is very scary. <laughs> it is very scary, though. I, I mean, certain scenes I still find a little bit uncomfortable to watch. But um... <laughs> there is one documentary. I don't remember its name specifically, but it had something to do with the cell as a whole. Um, I won't remember the name for sure, but the, the, there's amazing graphics whilst watching this movie because it's it's all about the journey of molecules inside the cell and it, it sort of zooms in into it and it's as if you're part of it. The visuals are just... Yeah, inside, it, inside the body. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, and it's just very well... It's, it's just very well mm-hmm. made because you look around and you know you have like the ribosome, which makes proteins, and you have the nucleus, which has the DNA, and, mm-hmm. it, has, and it, it slowly brings you to these pieces and you teaches you about them in a in a clever way if i if i remember the name i'll i'll send that over <laughs> yeah i wish i would remember more like positive movies about genetic engineering well because most of them they say that it's a scary bad thing and then most of them present scientists as some sort of crazy scientist but oh, yeah. that's not really yeah it's case. very much like yeah. these days uh, movies with artificial intelligence are depicted right so if you if you <laughs> would have watched uh, artificial intelligence in a, in a movie 10, 15 years ago, it would be that utopian, friendly, most most of the time female voice that helps you through your day with a hologram. And if you turn, a, yeah. if yeah. you watch a movie that has been done in the last five years, then of course it's that crazy mad scientist who uploaded himself into a supercomputer to control the world from now on. And, uh, or the, I don't know, uh, the, the Terminator-like scenarios are the ones um, um, producers are in love with these days. Um, Star Wars, yeah. Star Wars has uh, the clones, of course. Yeah, which is genetic engineering in itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. True. Cool. Yeah, I have to balance that. Uh, Let's it's say it's also Jurassic Park, like trying to revive dinosaurs. <laughs> and but uh, are the so. are those the movies you're cringing over? Isn't that the kind of movie where you walk uh, in and like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would say I hate the representation of scientists in those movies because they're always shown as like either like 
male all with crazy hair or like these crazy ideas, like very introverted, isolated from society. But that is not the case when you go and study science. You see actually lots of cool people and they all have like, they're all like you. They just they make like the same movies or they may, I don't know, do sports or whatever. They're, they're just normal. Yeah, so that is what the two of you tell us now. And then you turn off that screen and then you... And then, then you have like the... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably around your screen is a crowd of crazy men with funky hair and <laughs> you know, probably showing the flashcards of what you're supposed to say, you know, like yeah. say, this, say this. A needle with DNA in their hand. <laughs> Ready to inject us. <laughs> We might change into another human. I don't know if X Men. You know, there's this uh, character Jennifer X-Men. Lawrence plays. Like we, we shift skin into yeah, the yeah, people. Yeah. Oh yeah, can uh, can we get superpowers through genetic engineering? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it depends on what you consider a superpower. Yeah, it depends on what you want to attain, but. I suppose you can make um, maybe strong muscles made from spiders so they're a bit resilient and don't tear. That would be a superpower I'd want to have, like I, super tendons. I mean, the future of like superpowers and genetic engineering is going to be like stronger muscles, yeah. stronger hair, better vision, mm-hmm. preventing diseases. But the vision which the More intelligent, fits. yeah. But I think all of it will be restricted as well, um, just to prevent any sort of unwanted disadvantages or... Maybe modifications, but already now you don't even need genetic engineering to get in super strength. I think people yeah, who do, yeah. no, no, people who develop robots, there's this uh, skeleton that is developed for especially disabled people that gives them ability to walk and lift very heavy objects. And you just put it on and then you just like walk and lift stuff. There are already like things like this that enable us to do gain, like lift something much, much heavier than we would normally do. Yeah. And um, you don't need genetic engineering. So many things. I do. I do think I have a, a, a reading suggestion for you that you, the two of you, might enjoy. Um, the well, if you're into science fiction, that is. Um, it's a trilogy from Rames Naman, or no, Rames Nam is the name. Uh, he wrote a trilogy called the Nexus Trilogy, and it's it, okay. it's 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 a story about a future that's doesn't feel that far uh, in the in the future but it is about a world where we basically advance to have ais have uh, genetically engineering um of the kind that you described like uh, um having improved self-healing capabilities people that uh, mm. have um, are stronger than normal um and of course also militarily use technology but you have all sorts of people you have people that use those technology advancement to connect with each other and form their own form of religion and uh, collective beings you have others that just try to have a better time on this planet you have again others that <laughs> advance a political agenda and the whole trilogy is very yes. fascinating in the sense that it's playing with all these themes from a very knowledgeable place so uh, hmm. that's something I'll definitely look into yeah but also reminds us a bit about Blade Runner because the robots they were kind of made out of synthetic tissues as well, and it's kind of they had artificial intelligence to pre- to make them seem like human. And you know, there was this eye test where you could only certain people could test and yeah. tell they're, they're not human. So that's quite interesting as well. So, um, how this is going to go is uh, Sebastian and I will flip the coin and decide who is arguing for and against the motion that you suggested. And we will record it uh, as our next, re- when the next recording happens, we will record this motion first. We will use the recording that I just uh, took from our conversation. Not the whole thing, I will edit it a little bit, but uh, probably a substantial amount of it because you were just brilliant guests for this podcast. So <laughs> Thank you. And you host. So it was very um, interesting. Thanks for making the time. Yes. No worries. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. we really appreciate yeah. the chance to um, debate and talk about what we do. <laughs> it's, not, it's not an everyday experience. This was amazing. I had a ton of fun. Uh, I learned a lot and I'm now curious and now I already know what I hope, which side I'm going to land on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have to go. So thank you again. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah, hope you soon.